This is Court TV Live, your front row seat to justice. I'm Julie Grant. Thank you for being with us on this Friday afternoon. We've been anticipating the hearing for a new trial for Jeffrey Paschal. Let's go in together now. Okay, do we have Mr. Paschal at the facility? Yeah. All right. For the record, we're taking up the case of Jeffrey Ian Paschal. This is docket 116806. Mr. Paschal is joining us on an audio video connection from the Department of Correction. I can see and hear Mr. Paschal. Uh, Mr. Paschal, can you hear me okay? I'm sorry, what was that? I said yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, the audio cut out a little bit there. Uh, Mr. Paschal, your attorney, Greg Isaacs, is present here with us in the courtroom, and the state is represented by Attorney General Heather Good. And uh, we are here today to hear the defense motion for new trial. Uh, before we begin uh, with Mr. Paschal joining us remotely, uh, just for the record, Mr. Isaacs, this was at the defense request that we proceed in this fashion. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, very well. Uh, with that, Mr. Isaacs, will there be any proof in support of your motion? Uh, we have a uh, PowerPoint to highlight argument, but there will be no additional proof. Okay, any proof from the state today? No. Okay, very well. Argument from the defense? And, Judge, could you set it up? Okay, very well. And if we could access that. There we go. Um, may it please the court, um, if we could go to the first slide. Uh, pursuant to Rule 33, we're here for a motion for a new trial that was timely filed. Pursuant to Rule 33, uh, regarding a trial. Uh, that occurred uh, here in Division Two in Knox County, Tennessee, on October 6th and 7th. Uh, the sentencing uh, that we've also raised issues in the motion for new trial uh, was in February. Uh, as a preliminary uh, housekeeping matter uh, regarding the first issue that we'll address uh, with the court on the admission of cumulative and prejudicial photographs, uh, I have. Uh, talk to the state and after reviewing the original some of the original exhibits and discovery we are going to expand um, the exhibit designation to include the photographs in their entirety uh, just because there was some ambiguity there were three sets of pictures pictures taken that evening as the court will recall some pictures taken at the family crisis center and the pictures taken um, by uh, Ms. Chapman, and, and I do not want to inadvertently designate one erroneously, so we are going to uh, refer to all pictured exhibits with the court's permission. Any objection to the state? Okay, very well. Uh, the first issue that we would like to address in our Rule 33 motion for a new trial is uh, the court, and when I say the court aired, I mean uh, I will say respectfully once, and then if the court will allow me to include that uh, each time I mention uh, that phrase, uh, that the court aired in introducing a number of photographs which, which were cumulative and prejudicial. Uh, it is our position that they should not have been uh, introduced pursuant to Tennessee Rule of Evidence 401 and 403 because assuming that the cumul cumulative photographs uh, were otherwise relevant in terms of making a fact of consequence more or less probable, uh, that that was outweighed by their prejudicial uh, impact. Significantly, there were photographs entered of multiple uh, shots, photographs of similar or same injuries. Um, there were photographs that were taken uh, approximately two days later, which showed that the hematoma suffered by um, Ms. Chapman uh, was much different than those pictures showing how it depicted at or near uh, the time of the incident. Uh, we objected at trial, and it was our position that the number of photographs, along with allowing photographs uh, that were taken by Ms. Chapman 48 hours later uh, were prejudicial. 
the next slide, if we could. Uh, this one is, there, there, there were three motions for mis mistrial, as the court will recall. And this is an issue that was, uh, in our opinion, uh, extremely significant and problematic. Uh, and it related to Officer Johnson's intentional conduct, and it related to Mr. Paschal's uh, credibility in front of the jury. Um, as you'll recall, Officer Johnson responded that evening uh, regarding the domestic violence call. There was a bench conference where it was anticipated uh, that he was going to testify that the injuries, scratch marks, and wounds, in his opinion, may have been uh, self-inflicted by Mr. Paschal based on our firm's pretrial investigation. Uh, the court at the bench conference admonished uh, Officer Johnson not to go into that uh, opinion. Um, Officer Johnson, after we walked, I walked back to this very same podium uh, and continued. Um, Officer Johnson, when asked to describe the marks on Mr. Paschal by Ms. Good, uh, indicated that they looked self-inflicted. Uh, the only reasonable inference that can be drawn from Officer Johnson's testimony after the bench conference was it was intentional and it was uh, designed to uh, impact uh, the jury's perception of Mr. Paschal's credibility. If you'll recall, Officer Johnson apologized uh, after the fact, but uh, that was far too late and too little. Um, we moved for a mistrial based on Officer Johnson's intentional uh, misconduct, so, which was denied. Uh, the court did give a brief curative instruction, and is, it is our position based on the in intentional conduct by Officer Johnson that it was insufficient. Next. We are also uh, raising the issue that the court erred in allowing the admission of the body camera footage of the neighbor's house following the incident at issue. Uh, this footage was uh, taken from a body cam and um, aside from its uh, poor quality, uh, it showed Ms. Chapman in a huddled state uh, at the neighbor's house. Uh, the audio was um, We're going to pause there. this video at the point where he's talking about body camera footage that he's saying should not have gone before this jury. We have to go to a break. We'll be right back with more Court TV Live after this. With Shopify. This is Court TV Live, your front row seat to justice. I'm Julie Grant. Thank you for being with us on this Friday afternoon. Let's go back to Knoxville, Tennessee together now. We're watching a hearing where defendant Jeffrey Paschal is asking for a new trial. He was convicted of domestic violence related charges after an incident with his former girlfriend. We're going in now at the point where we left off where his attorney, Greg Isaacs, is talking about some body camera footage showing Kristen Chapman, who was the victim in this case, at her neighbor's house after the incident. She ran to the neighbor's house for some help. Let's go in where we left off together. The audio was um, very garbled, um, was not such that the jury, in my opinion, uh, could discern what she was specifically saying. Uh, and basically, a, a review of that video showed that it did not make a fact of consequence more or less probable as to whether Mr. Paschal committed aggravated kidnapping, uh, domestic violence, or interfered with a 911 call. Uh, if it did have some tenuous uh, probative value, it is our position under 403 that that probative value would have been outweighed by its prejudicial effect. Uh, the next issue that we'd like to raise um, is questions based on Mr. Paschal's uh, post-arrest conduct. And, and this was very significant because there was a some body cam, dash cam footage that showed Mr. Paschal after the arrest. Uh, Mr. Paschal uh, understandably was upset to be arrested. 
Um, sometime after a significant time, over an hour, he was placed in a the back of a police car, uh, went to pilot, and at some point he began uh, kicking the cruiser um, in response to the way he was being treated. Um, he was subsequently charged with vandalism. The state agreed pretrial to dismiss uh, the vandalism charge. Um, we were under the complete understanding that that post-event um, conduct and post-arrest conduct would not be brought before this jury. Uh, it was solicited by the state, wherein the state specifically asked, uh, in fact, you actually had to be restrained after you were arrested. Uh, again, uh, we objected and moved the court for a mistrial uh, that was denied. The next issue that we would like to bring to the court's attention under Rule 33 uh, is number six. Hmm? Uh, let, me, let me go back to number five. Um, the admission of testimony regarding the interview of Mr. Paschal. Um, again, I don't know that this was relevant. I, I don't think it was, if it was, it was prejudicial. And it was a reference to an interview that Mr. Paschal had apparently done that was um, accessed by the state on a YouTube channel. And in terms of the state's cross-examination, uh, do you recall doing an interview where you claimed that you had a screenshot of Ms. Wil Wilson speaking with your ex-wife immediately following the incident? It was not testimony that was sworn. It was not testimony uh, that was taken in the context of a deposition. Uh, it was a portion, a snippet, a part of an interview that had been pulled from the internet. Uh, we objected and we felt at the time at trial it was not relevant and prejudicial and we uh, today think that that was something that was significant when uh, it is viewed in the context of the other errors. Uh, but let's move forward to number six. And this is the third motion for mistrial that was made during the course of, of the trial. This instance um, that we think is a basis for granting a motion for a new trial pursuant uh, to Rule 33 is extremely significant. And if you look at the requirements under Tennessee law, this highlights um, the court's concern about conduct of this nature. Um, we had the trial, the trial was, was uh, hotly contested. It was hard fought. Mr. Paschal, as the court will recall, took the stand on his behalf. He was subject to a vigorous cross-examination by the state and Ms. Good. And after a recess, uh, I was professionally surprised and shocked when in rebuttal Ms. Chapman was called. Um, and. Previously, the state had not gone in in hardly any detail with the photographs uh, that were taken by Ms. Chapman that's a part of the motion for, for uh, Rule 33. We had not, and we had filed previously a 33-page approximately discovery request and had repeatedly requested any information regarding 404B evidence. Um, Ms. Good, to her credit, during the course of this trial, had provided statements, uh, been very open in the discovery process, uh, but that highlighted our comfort that there was no 404B coming from Ms. Chapman as it relates to uh, Mr. Paschal. In fact, during direct examination, there was no reference uh, to any prior bad acts by Mr. Paschal as it related to Ms. Chapman's testimony. However, during rebuttal, uh, Ms. Chapman sitting on the witness stand as, as she's talking about the pictures and the marks, uh, pauses. Uh, in the context of the pregnant pause, 
uh, actually smiles. I remember it very vividly and says, I don't know if I can say this. I had pictures of marks that he had left on my previously from previously. Uh, we immediately um, objected, uh, asked for an out of jury hearing. And if we could fast forward to that snippet of testimony. Um, and, and here is specifically the portion of, of, of the trial testimony uh, when this statement emerged. Question, and when you testified previously, you stated you had deleted some things on your phone. Can you tell us exactly what was deleted? Now, it, it's interesting because this didn't come up before. And so to ask her what she had deleted uh, creates an inference that this had to have some relevance or the state had to know where they were going with this line of questioning. Uh, in response, Ms. Chapman says, text, text message between us, every text that we had sent for our relationship, I had, I didn't delete them, and the whole text thread was gone when I got my phone back. Voicemails that he had left me were deleted. Pictures, some pictures, not all pictures, but some pictures were deleted off my phone. I had some. I don't know if I can say this. There is a pregnant pause and she smiles and then she blurts out, I had pictures of marks that he had left on me previously from previous. At this point, if the court will recall, uh, we objected. Uh, we asked for an out of jury hearing. Uh, the court took that testimony and the objection and the argument for mistrial very seriously. Um, as you'll recall, the court took a significant recess uh, to consider this issue. Um, but it is our opinion that this was a, a game changer in the course of this trial. Uh, and when you look at the standards under Holmes, Ware, and Patton, uh, we would submit that it is, it is an improper question by the state. At this stage, if you look at the next factor, relative strength of the state's proof, obviously the state agreed with me that the state of the proof uh, was not all that strong or they would not have called her in rebuttal. Um, next factor is whether the trial court uh, promptly gave a curative instruction. The court gave a limited curative instruction after a significant brief. Uh, after a significant break, rather. Um, but it is our very strong position that if you look at the issues raised with Officer Johnson, when he intentionally talked about self-inflicted wounds, and you have this witness, and think about this, why would someone say, I don't know if I can say this, uh, if they if they didn't have an idea or had been admonished or it had been discussed that this was improper, had not been dis disclosed to the defense, etc. She didn't say, I don't know if I could say this. Can I talk to my lawyer? Can, can, do we, can we approach? No. And the court knows, and we argued, if we had received notice of this prior bad act pursuant to 404B, uh, we would have been entitled to a hearing a hearing to determine by clear and convincing evidence uh, whether this was part, whether it was related, all the litany, all the hoops, all the, the issues, whether this met an exception uh, that would allow it to be admissible under 404B. Um, but we were denied that opportunity. Um, respectfully, it was one of those uh, instances of error that that the bell cannot be unrung by a curative instruction. Again, the court took a break. The court took significant time to consider the gravity uh, of this testimony. But when you when you break it down and you look at it, and if you look at the context of the question, 
Why would a prosecutor ask, and when you testified previously, you had deleted some things on your phone, can you tell us what was deleted unless there was some significance? So the significance had to be text message, voicemails, or pictures. Okay, we're so gonna hit the pause button right here. You're not gonna miss any of this hearing today here on Court TV. Let me bring in my guests. I have two great criminal defense attorneys to give us some analysis on this. Josh Schiffer and Don Malarsik are on the program today. Uh, tell me, what do you think so far of Greg Isaac's arguments he's making before the judge, Josh? You know, I think he's really doing a pretty spectacular job. It's non-confrontational, but it's firm. Uh, he's not castigating the judge for making mistakes or wagging a finger trying to create a really one-sided or lopsided uh, record. He's being very upfront about these are the issues that caused the problems that we're going to have to deal with on appeal if Your Honor doesn't come back and grant us the relief of a new trial. And so, Judge, we're going to ask you to please be efficient. Let us try this case again rather than have to go through the appellate dance. Right. And, Don, my question for you, please, is something we had you touch on earlier in the program about how a motion for a new trial isn't like an appeal where you're in front of different judges, the appellate court. You're not in front of the same person who oversaw the trial, made the decisions, and you said you have to be really delicate when you're, you're saying there are errors we want you to look at, Your Honor. Uh, how did you think about uh, Greg Isaac's uh, take on it early on where he said, Judge, I'm just going to say this once, the court erred, and then I'm going to go through the various things. Things. Uh, what'd you think of that approach? You know, I, I thought it was the right approach. I think he's trying to really delicately get his points across. I think Josh is absolutely right. He's not, you know, banging his fist on the on the uh, podium. He's not being overly dramatic. He's keeping a very respectful tone. He's acknowledging that the case law supports his position. And you know, Julie, I'm sure you've experienced this too, and I know Josh and I have. I don't know that judges really take this too personally. I mean, that's part of their job, right? We, we expect them to understand we're going to challenge their decisions. And every decision they make, someone's going to be unhappy. So this is a pretty experienced judge. I can't imagine um, the judge is really upset by this motion. But I think the lawyer's doing a really nice job being very professional and also being really effective for his client. Great context from you both. Don Malarsic, Josh Schiffer, thank you both so much. We're going to squeeze in a break. Stand by. Uh, We're going to take you back into the courtroom for more of this hearing when Court TV Live rolls on. Free app now. Yes. This is Court TV Live, your front row seat to justice. I'm Julie Grant. Thank you for being with us on this Friday afternoon. So we're in Knoxville, Tennessee for a hearing where Jeffrey Paschal is asking for a new trial after his convictions on domestic violence charges. We're going to go back in where we left off. We're seeing his attorney, Greg Isaacs, making the arguments on his behalf. Minefield. You know that you are about to touch and open Pandora's box. And then when you when you set the stage, then you have the witness in in rebuttal that says, I, I, I don't know if I can say this, and smiles and does. And after she smiled, she stuck a dagger through the heart of Jeffrey Paschal's uh, defense. I couldn't cross-examine her about it. I mean, you talk about, you know, cross-examination 101, don't ask a question that you don't know the answer. I had no idea. Uh, it hit the defense completely out of left field, and, and it shouldn't. It never should in a serious felony case. Uh, when we had specifically requested notice of 404B. So this motion for new trial pursuant to Rule 33 begins and ends with the intent and the context of this testimony by Ms. Chapman in rebuttal. We would respectfully say under Tennessee law that this is, and I know the court, um, and I'm not, I, I'm not being critical, I'm, I'm being positive about the time you took to carefully consider the issue when you came back on. I mean, I, the court looked and, and, and I could tell struggled and addressed the issue. But if there is an issue when you compound it with Officer Johnson and the other issues, this issue compels the court to grant a motion for new trial. And respectfully, 
regardless of my position or the state's position, it's Ms. Chapman's position that compels the court to exercise this Rule 33 remedy when she says, I had some, I don't know if I can say this, but we respectfully, earnestly, strenuously ask the court to consider this again as refle reflectively as you did and give Mr. Paschal a chance for a fair trial. Next issue, number seven, uh, sufficiency of the evidence. Uh, it's our position that the evidence was not sufficient um, to convict him. If you look at the testimony and evidence uh, that should have been omitted and should not have been omitted, uh, we think the record is problematic as it relates to aggravated kidnapping. Um, the testimony at trial was, was benign as it relates to the cell phone being taken, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the last issue, the next one, um, uh, Allison Moon, um, we were provided a proffer of Ms. Moon's testimony the evening before the sentencing. Uh, I know our procedural rules as it relates to sentencing hearings are different than the procedural protections and notice requirements of uh, trial with 404B. Um, the admissibility threshold is different because it talks about criminal conduct and offenses. So it is broader. But in this context, based on the fact that this witness was a plaintiff in pending civil litigation as it relates to an ongoing custody battle and the graphic nature of her allegations coupled with the fact that she and Ms. Chapman were in constant if not frequent contact uh, would have compelled a brief recess. Next. Um, this issue, um, we obviously disagree with the imposition of an 18-year sentence uh, based on the imposition and consideration of the aggravating and mitigating factors. But specifically, uh, one thing that we want to highlight and address, it is our position pursuant to TCA 4035-106-A1-B5 that the federal Texas convictions as it related to sell and delivery of uh, drugs, cocaine and marijuana, cocaine and uh, attempted sell of marijuana uh, were not proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, in terms of procedural requirements, uh, when we had that argument in real time and looking at that statute, um, it, it's one of the few other than when you're looking uh, at the standard, our constitutional standard for a trial beyond a reasonable doubt, where you have an admissibility standard uh, that is not clear and convincing. It's, it's beyond uh, preponderance. It is beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, we would say that the records obtained by the state, I know the state tried to obtain the records and the federal authorities were not cooperative with Ms. Good. Um, but when you apply that very stringent standard, uh, we respectfully would assert that um, the uh, consideration of that conviction uh, was legally inappropriate. And we would respectfully ask the court um, to take judicial notice of the um, record that's before you. We would ask the court as part of the motion for new trial to consider the trial record in its entirety and uh, would ask the court to grant a motion for new trial pursuant to Rule 33. General Good. Judge, I'll try and take these in the same order here. Judge, as it relates to the admission of the... Right, so before we hear the state's response, we're going to squeeze in a break. we got to do that at this time anyways because we're at the bottom of the hour. So hitting pause, you're going to hear the state's reply to why Jeffrey Paschal should not get a new trial. That's coming up right after this. Personal, personal loan.
Thanks for staying with us here on Court TV Live. I'm Julie Grant. Let's go back into the courtroom in Knoxville, Tennessee together now, and we're going to hear from the state. We know Jeffrey Paschal thinks he should get a new trial. Of course, they're going to say he should not. Let's hear those arguments and what they say together now. The injuries on Ms. Chapman, as Mr. Isaac said, I do agree that there were kind of three separate time periods that we're dealing with uh, where the photographs were taken initially. Photographs were taken of her injuries while she's in her neighbor's home in the kitchen, and that was taken the night when police are initially called. She then goes to the Family Justice Center the following day. They take some additional photos. The day after that, uh, Ms. Ms. Chapman herself took some more photos. Uh, we do not believe that the photographs are in any way prejudicial or cumulative. The photographs, um, as the court will remember, the injuries to Ms. Chapman really developed within about three days. And so the intent for introducing those photographs was, was to show, first of all, the extent of her injuries because the initial photographs that were taken on scene, you, you didn't see all the bruising. And so some of her injuries weren't as apparent from those initial photographs that forensics took. And so that was really the the main purpose for introducing the photographs taken in in the days after was to show the jury the nature and extent of the significant injuries that she had suffered uh, the state's position is that th they certainly were relevant um, as it relates to her injuries we had to we had to show that she had bodily injury and the progression of those injuries over the next couple of days really painted the entire picture of how significant they were and so we do not believe that there was any error as to as it relates um, to the photographs themselves as to officer johnson's testimony regarding the scratches the court uh, when we had initially brought this issue up outside of the presence of the jury it was the state's position at that time that Although Officer Johnson certainly was not a medical expert by any means, um, it, it was our position that a lay person could testify, in their opinion, whether or not scratch marks, that these were not the type of injuries that required medical expert testimony, that sort of thing. Um, the court did tell Officer Johnson not to go into that, and when I asked him to describe the marks, as, as we talked about at the bench, what we... What we were trying to get to was um, the directionality and where they were actually located on the defendant's body. But yes, he did, he did say that he believed that um, the marks to be self-inflicted. We do believe that any error um, was harmless in this regard. Again, the jury, the defendant actually took the stand and tried to blame the marks on, on the victim. And so we do believe it kind of counters that as well. He says it, he brings it up in the portion of the body cam video where he's talking to the officer. He says that the victim is the one that caused these scratch marks. Again, it's our position that you, you don't necessarily need medical expert testimony. A lay person has witnessed scratches on themselves, witnessed scratches on other people. And so we do not believe that there was any error there that uh, would have been grounds for a mistrial. And we believe that the cumulative instruction was sufficient. As to the admission of the body camera footage showing the victim in Ms. Um, Guja's uh, floor um, in her kitchen area soon after officers arrived, the main purpose of showing that body camera footage, one, was to, again, show some of the injuries, but two, um, from, from Vore Dyer to opening, every, every opportunity that the defense had to get up here and talk to the jury, they immediately started painting a picture of Ms. Chapman as being ex exceedingly drunk, belligerent, violent, angry. That was kind of their whole theory here, was that she was she was completely uh, trashed, drunk. She had been at a bar for five hours. She was the one acting crazy. And so the body cam footage showing her demeanor while she is in the floor, crouched down in Miss Gooch's kitchen, was relevant to show that she, in fact, was not belligerent. Um, you can hear her speak very clearly on that body cam. You can see how she is interacting with the officers. And it was up to the jury to determine whether or not they believed the defense's story that she was this drunken, violent, raging person that they tried, they attempted to paint her out to be. And so we do not believe that there was any error in the admission of the body camera footage either. The purpose for the uh, 
question that I did ask about Mr. Paschal being restrained after he was arrested, the, the intent behind that question was, was kind of an impeachment question because he took the stand in his own defense and got up there and painted himself as the most calm, cool, collected individual that you would ever meet in your entire life. He, when he, when he was up there saying that Ms. Chapman had actually been the one assaulting him for um, some period of time prior to the police being called, again, he said he never got angry, not one time, that he just kept trying to calm her down, that he wasn't mad at her, that, you know, nothing about the situation with Ms. Chapman made him mad. And so the intent of that question was to show that he, in fact, was not this calm, cool, collected person that he tried to portray himself to be on the stand. Uh, Mr. Isaac subjected. I have moved on with my questioning. He didn't, he didn't even have to answer it. So again, we do not believe that there is an error there that affects um, the overall evidence in this case and would be grounds for a new trial. Um, the testimony regarding the previous interview of Mr. Paschal, again, the reason for that was to show prior inconsistent statements while he was on the stand testifying. When he was on the stand and testified, he said that this argument um, that they had had that night started because she, she the victim, Ms. Chapman, believed that Mr. Paschal was uh, texting another female. Throughout this whole process, as we all know, Mr. Paschal made so many inconsistent statements as to one, as to the victim's motivation. He said on numerous occasions that this all happened solely because um, he was going to leave her. And then he said, no, this is just these three women is, is what, in that uh, video that he made called the women, the allegations or whatever it was called. He specifically said that these three women, two of his ex-wives and the victim were colluding against him um, to try and get custody of his children taken away. He also said that he, uh, in the interview, he said, he, <clears throat> excuse me, he said he had a screenshot showing that the night in question, um, after the assault took place, that he had a screenshot of the victim speaking, FaceTiming with two of his ex-wives, which again was was completely untrue. It went it went directly to his credibility. One, he had no such no such screenshot, but has made this public recorded statement. And two, um, we discussed with Ms. Chapman that she had never even spoken to the ex-wives until after all this happened. So again, it just went straight to his credibility. Um, do believe that it was an appropriate line of questioning and that there was no error there. As to Ms. Chapman's uh, statement that she had a picture of marks left on her, um, I, I want to touch on a couple of things that Mr. Isaacs just said. Um, first and foremost, the state would not agree that the evidence in this case wasn't strong enough. The reason that we called Ms. Chapman as a rebuttal witness was obviously because the defendant testified and, and had some pretty strong allegations against Ms. Chapman. And so, um, as it relates specifically to 404B, well, no, we didn't file a 404B notice on prior abuse because we had absolutely no intent to introduce or to seek to introduce such evidence. Um, she, when she said, I don't know if I can say this, it's because I personally had told her on numerous occasions, you cannot, you cannot and we will not talk about things that happened. So of, of course there was no 404B notice filed because I had no intention of using such evidence. Um, I will note, however, that throughout the, dis the pendency of this case that there have been numerous documents that were provided to the defense, including the order of protection that was um, sought by Ms. Chapman after this happened, where she details very vividly a lot of, of prior abuse. And so to say that they had no knowledge whatsoever, I do believe is, is inaccurate. But again, I didn't file a notice on that because I had no intention to use that evidence. As to why I asked the question, um, specifically as to why I asked the question related to what was specifically deleted from her phone, when, when Mr. Paschal was on the stand and Mr. Isaacs was questioning him, Mr. Isaacs specifically asked him about, um, you heard Ms. Chapman say that she had photographs from you all at dinner that night. Yes. 
Now, if you had deleted everything in her phone, like sh like she said you did, she wouldn't have photographs, would she? So what they were doing when Mr. Paschal was up there on direct is they were trying to insinuate that Ms. Chapman was lying about the deletion of her phone by saying that you couldn't have deleted it because she still had pictures from that night on there. And so the intent of my question was just, just to clarify for the jury that she never testified that he went through and wiped her phone completely. What she testified to originally, which was misstated by the defense multiple times throughout the trial, they constantly kept saying that she had testified that he had deleted everything from her phone and that's simply not what she testified to. And so I was only asking that question for, for clarity so that the jury wouldn't think that she had, had testified that he had deleted everything. So that was the purpose of that question. As to her comment, um, yes, we do agree that it was an inappropriate comment. Like I said, during the trial, I, I had told her that we weren't going to talk about that and I had no intention of eliciting that sort of testimony. With that being said, we do not believe that the actual statement that she made was overwhelmingly prejudicial as to um, require a mistrial. She did not talk about, she didn't say what the marks were. She didn't say this was from a prior time when he had abused me, from a prior assault. She did not say anything. She just said, left marks previously. Again, while we, we would agree that we didn't necessarily want that response, we don't believe that it rises to the level of requiring either a mistrial during the time or requiring a new trial at this time, given the overwhelming evidence of her injuries, given her testimony, and given the defendant's completely inconsistent statements while he was on the stand. Let's see here. I won't go into the sufficiency of the evidence um, other than to say that we, we absolutely do not agree that the evidence was not um, sufficient in this case. We believe that the evidence of Mr. Paschal's guilt was pretty overwhelming and that his story of her falling into a door or falling into a bush um, simply could not and would not account for the extent of her injuries. So we believe that all counts that he was convicted of, that there was certainly sufficient evidence as to each. As to the motion to continue the sentencing hearing, again, we, we argued this before, so I won't get into much detail. I will just let the court know that as soon as I got that statement, that email from Miss Moon the night before sentencing, I provided that to the defense. Um, I, don't think I, I don't think I had to do it then. I don't think I had to give them that statement for a sentencing, but I did. The defense was, while they did not have that statement, the defense for months was on notice that I was going to be calling Miss Moon at sentencing. They were on notice. They had the prior police reports involving Miss Moon for months and months. So they, they did know that she was going to come to testify regarding prior abuse. When I, when I asked her the day before, I said, hey, just real quick, can you send me an email kind of detailing what it is that you are going to say? She did that, and I immediately sent it um, to defense counsel. So we don't believe that there was any error in um, denying the motion to continue the sentencing hearing. Additionally, um, we, the court took a lot of time when we were looking at the issue involving Mr. Paschal's range. Uh, the court went into years and years, actually, of legislative history, of legislative intent, printed out. I believe the stack was pretty large, actually. Um, and yes, while we could not show the specific quantities that were involved in Mr. Paschal's federal sentencing, again, at the time, under Tennessee law, the possession with intent to sell or deliver in any amount was, I believe, a C felony, if I'm remembering correctly. And so, I, again, I do not believe that the court erred in any way. I believe that the proof was beyond a reasonable doubt that he has these prior convictions and that these prior convictions would make him a range two offender. 18 years was within the range. Um, there were a lot of enhancement factors that the court considered given the testimony of prior abuse by Ms. Moon and by uh, Ms. Chapman. We believe that the court appropriately applied the enhancement factors and gave the appropriate sentence in this case. And so we would ask um, that the motion for a new trial be denied.
Thank you, General. Mr. Isaacs, it's your motion. Sir. All right, so with that, the state's response is in, and we're going to get a ruling from the court today. We're squeezing in a break, and we're a little behind on the video, so stay tuned. It's going to happen next. We'll be right back here on Court TV Live. You don't want it. Thanks for staying with us here on Court TV Live. Let's go back into the courtroom in Knoxville, Tennessee, and see what the judge's decision is, whether or not Jeffrey Paschal will get a new trial. Uh, one, I want to say that I agree with, with Ms. Good in terms of the spirit of her cooperation in doing things, and we'll say that I do not uh, have not alleged directly or indirectly that she did anything intentional. Nevertheless, the errors that we have set forth with Officer Johnson, which was intentional, with Ms. Chapman, which was intentional, uh, rise to the level of Rule 33, uh, an instance that would grant a basis under Tennessee law for a, a motion for a new trial. Uh, again, uh, I, we, we had knowledge of prior conduct, whatever, but we were relying on the fact that it was not going to come in and we couldn't have a hearing. Just because we had knowledge, we uh, did not agree to its veracity, accuracy. Um, but again, uh, we think all the issues are viable, but I think this motion for new trial begins and ends with the... Um, rebuttal utterance by Ms. Chapman and Officer Johnson's defiance of this court. And again, we thank the court for your patience during the trial. Uh, we thank your court, the court for your patience this afternoon and would renew our request for a new trial. Thank you, Mr. Isaacs, and thanks to uh, all counsel uh, for their work on this motion. I will be uh, respectfully denying the motion for new trial. That means that the deadline for filing a notice of appeal will be in 30 days. Mr. Isaacs, will you be representing Mr. Paschal on direct appeal? I will. Okay, very well. We'll get that notice filed and we'll go from there. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. And look at Jeffrey Paschal up out of his seat, walking out from in front of that video. You know, he's at the facility, uh, the prison where he's serving his 18 years, able to watch this hearing, watch the arguments his attorney put forth. Uh, very well fought fight, uh, but the motion for a new trial is denied. He is going to take an appeal. We've heard that from his attorney, Greg Isaacs, uh, who's going to continue to represent him throughout that process. Let me get some reaction from my guests. Joining me in Akron, Ohio, attorney Don Malarsik, and in Atlanta, Georgia, attorney Josh Schiffer. Great to have you both. Uh, Don, what do you think? Uh, your reaction to the court's decision, please. I'm not too surprised, Julie. These are really tough motions. They're pretty routine. I thought the defense put up some really good arguments, cited some great case law. Uh, they laid the groundwork for, I think, a, a very thoughtful appeal. But these are really, really tough positions to take. And I can count on one hand, really, the number of times a trial judge has granted a new trial for me. So they're pretty rare. I appreciate that context. Uh, Josh, have you found the same in your experience that it's pretty rare to get this kind of post-conviction relief? Yeah, it really is. There are perfunctual and necessary reasons to go through this process, primarily so that you preserve your client's rights. But going back to something Don had mentioned previously, this is a regular part of practicing law where your work is going to be called in for critique by opposing counsels and triers of fact. Every criminal defense lawyer gets accused of ineffective assistance of counsel from a prior client because that's what appeals are based off of. Same with a judge. Every trial is going to have arguments at one point or another about what the judge might have done wrong and gives the judge an opportunity to fix it prior to the court of appeals being able to review the entire transcript. So this wasn't surprising. We'll see what the Court of Appeals does. Gotcha. So you almost kind of expect it, expect this uh, to happen. Uh, appreciate all of the context and insight you both offered today. Always a pleasure to have you too. Josh Schiffer, Don Malarsic, thank you both so much and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Have a great one, everyone.